And some of you may remember when Nathan Shedroff came and spoke about that here a number of years ago. He has turned over the reins to a new chair, thank you very much, and Andy comes back to the Bay Area from having spent a number of years in Sydney, Australia. Without further ado. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and also thank you for the privilege of and inviting me to come speak tonight. Um, it was it was actually quite a quite a little funny fun surprise when I got the invitation from Paul to speak. Um, normally, a Tuesday night for me would be in, involved sitting at home with my with my dogs, re reading my students' homework assignments, and so an, an opportunity to go and do something else on a Tuesday night was actually would considered by me to be a, a quite to have a privilege. So, the. The basis of this talk actually comes from um, a number of different directions, but most of the ideas that you're going to hear about tonight have been developed over the last uh, two years uh, by myself and some of my colleagues at the Delft University of Technology. And it was born out of a frustration and kind of, of the following thing, which was that we saw that while design was something that was well regarded in universities and something that has started to de uh, develop traction in relation to uh, improve working with corporate strategy. What we saw, however, was that the, that the field of design was actually, it seemed to be as if it were maturing in, in kind of the corporate sense uh, and had hit some kind of theoretic, theoretical plateau in relation to the way that it could actually contribute to the way that companies run and operate themselves. And we were trying to wonder, trying to think, why, why is that happening? You know, what really is going on here? And we started to make, kind of make this metaphor, which is that if design were a company of its own, it was kind of making this uh, disruptive play. You know, design started out here in the Valley uh, first as not necessarily uh, a, a skill that was highly valued. Um, and this is actually well documented in Barry Cates' book called Making It, Make It Better, um, A History of Silicon Valley Design. And he talks about how design starts to take off early on um, before around the Apple, uh, Apple One years. Uh, and it started to become regarded as something serious, almost at the same level as engineering. And then over time, design companies started to realize that they were actually not only good at doing the technical design work, but that actually they were also very good at helping companies to figure out what it is that they should do next. And so design firms started to call themselves doing design strategy work. And then there are now a number of design type positions in which you would put the word something strategy in front of it. But really it all kind of comes from of the concept of design strategy. So we're kind of moving up in the world in relation to those ideas. But what we haven't moved into, though, is in the final territory of, so to speak, the big brother in the room, the big sister in the room, which is the economic theory. Why does design actually matter to the central functioning of companies? Why does design provide, for example, an explanation that companies should exist at all? Why does design tell us something about the scale and the scope of companies? Because these are actually some of the fundamental economic questions that economists want to understand when they want to try to understand the economic organization. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. And I also need to preface a little bit by telling you a bit more about my background so that you understand some of the ideas and where these ideas are, are coming from. So as, uh, as was mentioned, I'm currently the chair of the MBA in Design Strategy um, at the California College of the Arts. Uh, and we could spend an entire hour, actually, just trying to define what design strategy is. But I won't be doing that, because that's what my students are harassing me all the time, which is to help them define what is design strategy. Because, I spend all, because they tell me that they spend a lot of time explaining to their friends and their colleagues who come from more conventional business school programs who always ask them, What's design strategy, and why is that anything different from competitive strategy? Again, cluing us on, on this particular issue that many people outside of our communities don't really understand how design is central to the economic organization of firms. The second part I think I need to emphasize is I come from what I, I have to have had to call the behavioral school of design research. And the reason why I have to say that is that the, the, the term design thinking has become very popular. It has become highly popularized, and everyone says, and every, uh, many companies now say, we do design thinking. So as soon as I tell people that I do design thinking research, you know, the, the first thing that they tell me is like, oh, 
uh, yeah, I took a class uh, on design thinking. We put up post-it notes, and we did this, and we did that, and it was really cool and really fun. And I have to tell them, that's nice, but that's actually not what I do. <laughs> you know, what I do is, uh, and what the Behavioral School of Design Research does, is that we focus on the study of designers. So our object of study are design practitioners, real human beings who do this kind of work, and we look for regular patterns that lead to productive, act, productive behavior. Very much the kind of work for some of you who do user research. That shouldn't seem to be a very kind of strange uh, approach uh, to, do your, your, to, to doing the work. But that's what we do. So we study and we observe design practitioners doing their work. And from that, we try to develop theories that explain uh, the basis of productivity um, in, in design activity. So that's really the background that I'm coming from. I'm not going to be talking tonight too much from the design thinking kind of from the management school um, led by people like Gene Lee and others um, who you, you may be familiar with, or Tim Brown and his writings uh, in HBR, that that is a very different school of design thinking. So I'm coming from this behavior school. So a lot of what you're going to see tonight is going to be a lot of ideas that really basically come from cognitive psychology. And that's where I would like to, to actually begin uh, the conversation this evening. So there's a, a fun quiz that I give to people uh, when I've given this talk before. And the quiz begins by asking people, why do you think companies exist? And only one of these is not a real theory. <laughs> So do you think that companies exist because they're there to manage knowledge? Do you think companies exist because they're there to make decisions about pricing, production volumes, and resource allocations? And you can already tell from the language that only an economist would write that. Um, do you think that a, a company uh, exists to design and diffuse trade testable better ideas? Do you think companies exist to minimize transaction costs for services that could otherwise be contracted from the open market? Or do you think companies exist simply to minimize Okay, so depending on how old you are and which in, in the audience, uh, if the younger the audience, the more likely it is that you choose the last one uh, to minimize tax liability. That's actually the, the only fake theory um, of, uh, in here. That's actually not a theory of firms. That might be a, a reason why some firms might want to incorporate so they can avoid tax liability, but that really isn't it. But actually, uh, answer number four is actually the original uh, transaction cost economics explanation for why it is that firms exist. Companies exist because it's, it's, they're able to take under the direct control, basically take cost control within the boundaries of the firm. And that the cost control is cheaper within the boundaries of the firm than to going to the external market in order to contract for those services. And that's why you see, for example, companies acquiring other companies often, because it's actually cheaper for them to hold on to the, those supplier resources, or when they will start to spin off a company because it, it turns out that it actually is cheaper now uh, to go out to the open market for some of those services. One of the reasons why freelancing has become so popular these days because the freelancing uh, technologies that have been made available have actually made it much, much cheaper for you to be able to contract for services outside the boundaries of the firm. But I'm going to, of course, be promoting number three, right? The idea that, that uh, firms exist to design uh, and diffuse trade-tested better ideas, and, and we're going to have to kind of explore uh, what that really means. But fundamentally, in order to start for this conversation, I, we have to then show the following chart, which comes straight out of um, cognitive psychology. The reason why I have to show this chart is that economists have a very similar kind of chart. So for economists, a lot of the theorization on economic organization is, is going to come from a demand curve. And so if any of you took microeconomics or macroeconomics in, in, at, you know, at college at some point, you probably remember, or you, you would have seen it possibly at one point, the picture of what a demand curve looks like. And it looks like this generally. It's an exponential and it's decreasing. And basically the theory behind the demand curve is that um, the, the, uh, the demand drops as price increases. Okay? And then a lot of all the economic theorizing comes out from that. In other words, you want to price your, um, your product or service at a level in which the, the demand would be highest and you want to optimize uh, that selection. But I actually want to propose to you a very different curve as a fundamental curve about thinking about why it is that firms exist from a design point of view which is grounded in this notion of creativity and novelty, which I think is the backbone of design work. And this curve uh, comes from a, a cognitive psychologist oft, often regarded to as a father um, of, of ex experimental psychology, and his name is Wilhelm Wundt, W-U-N-D-T. 
Uh, and actually, this curve itself was popularized um, by another psychologist named Berline, who studied uh, curiosity. And basically, the idea behind this curve is the following. So the curve ha has two axes, and the first axis is novelty, and the second axis is hedonic value. The idea that Berline was actually trying to study was at what point, in terms of stimulus, do you become aroused by that stimulus? And for him, the level of arousal uh, is uh, hedonic value, and the stimulus is measured in terms of its novelty, or in a sense, its aesthetic appeal. And the curve basically begins from zero, which is indifference. In other words, if I see something that I've seen before, and I've seen it lots and lots of times, that stimulus is not going to generate anything for me in terms of hedonic value. But as I increase that level of novelty, at some point, that hedonic value is now going to start to increase. In other words, there's some novelty there. And at some point, it peaks. At that point thereafter, though, if I, you give me more stimulus, um, in other words, more novelty, well, I start to find it to be a bit unpleasing. And at an at extreme level, I would find that it actually is now displeasurable. And that's why we see the curve going uh, below, uh, below zero in terms of the hedonic value. So in other words, basically, our curve, which is, is not quite like a demand curve, uh, is bounded or driven by two different opposing forces, one which is a reward for novelty and one which is a punishment for conventionality. So in other words, we can think about the forces that drive companies um, as being driven by a reward for a certain kind of novelty and a punishment when you are a, a firm that is too far from where it is that people want your conventionality to be. And so the, that the management prescription becomes one of figuring out the right level of novelty that I have to give into the world versus the amount of conventionality, uh, in other words, the amount of the world that I have to bring with me, because otherwise I will then incur a punishment. So we can actually look at this curve from both the point of a, a firm and of an entire industry. So there may be some firms and some industries in which there is a very strong reward for novelty. So in consumer products, fast-moving consumer goods, et cetera, there would be a strong movement for novelty. People want new and fresh on a regular basis. The food industry uh, would, be a, it would be the same, right? You can't kind of keep making the same old, same old food forever. Um, at some point, people will become, eventually, will be bored with your food concept, and you need to refresh your particular food concept. There are other industries in which that would not be the case. So oil and gas, for example, we, would be one of those industries in which there is a very uh, weak reward for novelty uh, and a very strong uh, penalty uh, or um, punishment if you d uh, deviate too much from conventionality. So that, w that kind of industry will work in a different direction. And of course, this curve also moves um, in three dimensions. Uh, so time is the, d is the axis that I don't show, don't show you here. And so that would actually be a surface. So if we use this curve, actually, as our foundation, so in other words, rather than using a demand curve, which is what economists would use to think about, um, about where uh, firms come from, but we use this curve and use novelty um, as a place where we are coming from in relation to the development of firms, then we start to come up with a very different realization and a, certain, a very different kind of theorization about where, do, uh, where companies come from. And that's where we're going to go uh, from here. Did anybody have any questions about this curve? Because it's, it's, the, it's the thing that, that actually drives this, my thinking. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, sure, go ahead. Please do that. I was thinking that it uh, seems like similar to Raymond Lowy's concept of Maya, most advanced yet acceptable. Yeah, I, mean, I have to say, uh, so it, as with demand curves, um, many other concepts have, be, have been derived from this particular concept, and sometimes without, kind of transparently. That in other words, that people didn't necessarily know that it goes, because this, is, this curve is, comes from the eight, late 1800s, is actually when, um, when, uh, uh, when Wundt uh, developed this particular idea, because he was actually moving um, psychology from a, a field of philosophy into a field of empirical science. And so he was trying to develop mathematical tools to try to actually help him study uh, the relation at the, the point at which you would become aroused. And then what, what, what we're trying to do now is to say that actually this curve, if you apply this particular idea to firms, it actually also works very well. So firms can only uh, keep what they are going, doing, what, keep on doing what they are doing only for so long 
and tell it is that the, the, the novelty that they have introduced um, into the world is no longer a value. So the hedonic value has dropped. And basically at that point, they have to figure out a way to renew themselves or eventually they're going to go out of business. Yes? Um, this isn't about a firm, but it's a product example. Um, if you think of Coke Classic, which they had to call it when they tried to switch it away from the original formula. I'm wondering, it just seems like a little bit of an exception. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> here's, and here's the amusing bit it's with e economics. You know, the, the demand curve is actually very difficult to observe um, and actually has really formally never actually been empirically observed. Um, and uh, I, 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 I completely agree with what you're saying. So, you know, this is a stylization for us to think at a firm level. But even I think if you looked at a company like Coca-Cola, I mean, while they may have one specific product line that doesn't change uh, very much over a long period of time, the company itself has actually had to introduce lots of novelty over time, such as, for example, getting into the bottle of water or, or just simply a flavored water um, line of business as well. So they've actually done lots of different things to keep um, their, their concept of Coca-Cola fresh, um, if you will, because at some point, you know, people do get a little bit bored um, of, the, of the basic concept of the Coca-Cola, or at least the, the beverages um, that, that Coca-Cola as a company provides. But yes, there will always be products that are classic as well, so they would defy the, the, the conventionality and reward curve uh, on, a, on a specific product level. But there are probably very few of those, those, few of those ones. Most, most products, as you would know, they, they die after a rather short period of time. So I want to take you through a couple stories um, to, to, yeah, okay. So in the case of Coke, to continue that, would the novelty potentially come in through their marketing strategy in that they create novelty for the same product, but their marketing messages change to introduce novelty? I would agree with that, uh, with that claim. That, you, that the, the basic idea is that if, if everything is exactly the same in relation to the way the, the, the product itself is marketed, or actually the word that I would use, and I will use later on, the way that the product is framed, uh, then the hedonic value for that product will continue to drop. And so unless you actually do something to, in a sense, to reframe, um, then the hedonic value will no longer be of value to the company. And so therefore, eventually, it will go down to the indifference or you're punished. Uh, for not being, um, for basically being the same idea for, for far too long of a period of time. Yeah, so basically I'm not saying that, that novelty has to be embodied within the product as well, but novelty at some level of the firm, um, which is what we're going to provide as, as a definition um, uh, in just a few minutes, is actually what firms have to seek to find. So they have to secure um, some level of novelty um, within the firm over a period of time, and that's what actually allows the, the firm to start up as well as to continue to exist. And then if we use this curve, by the way, as a, as a mode of thinking, we don't have to bring in additional concepts like innovation, for example, uh, which is actually not part of classical economics. Innovation is actually neoclassical economics because classical economics uh, assumes companies go into equilibrium. That's the way that economists will, would think about it. If you read economics papers, uh, I'm, I'm greatly simplifying and in case economists hear this afterwards, they're gonna come and yell at me. But basically all economic papers at some point take a derivative and then they set the derivative equal to zero because they're looking for an equilibrium point. Uh, so right, all games in game theory, for example, look for the equilibrium points. So everything goes to equilibrium and innovation is considered an aberration from, e from, in uh, from, uh, in uh, from equilibrium. But in this particular view, no the continuous search for novelty is basically what drives the, the evolution of firms. And so we don't have to add in any additional um, explanations why it is that firms continue to do things such as refresh their brand strategy, refresh the way that they frame themselves, et cetera. That's actually just part of the way that firms operate. Great. Okay, so let me give you a couple stories which I hope to will, can use to elaborate some of these particular ideas and also to contrast with some of the existing theories of the firms and where I think some of those ideas go a little bit um, awry. So I took the following statement from the S1 filing for, uh, of Square, which I think most of us have used at one point. Uh, we've all uh, gone to a coffee shop or bought something possibly at an open air market where someone had their iPhone and then we swiped our credit card um, on, that, on that device and we paid for that um, without um, having to have any cash. And this is what the founders wrote about um, Square um, in, their, um, uh, in their founders paragraph. 
So they say, we started Square because Jim Mc McKelvey, our co-founder and my second boss after my mother, um, could not accept a credit card for his art. Square was born out of our experience. We built a working prototype, a mo mobile credit card reader that plugged into the audio jack of an iPhone and an app to enter an amount and process the payment. But it took us a year to convince the financial industry to allow us to make Square broadly available. Now, where this statement is actually kind of problematic um, for some theories of the firm um, are the following. So first of all, we're not really sure when it is that the co-founders took out a contract with each other in order to decide that they were going to be a firm. Or whether or not they simply did that because they needed a way to protect their in intellectual property. But it didn't really seem that the contract was really the basis for that formation of the, of the firm. The basis for the formation of the firm was the fact that they had this interesting design. You know, that was a, a specific technique for them to accept uh, payment uh, using a uh, device connected to an iPhone. The second part uh, uh, is that it's really unclear whether or not the, these two people had anything in the way of what um, res uh, economists would say assets. Now, we can say that they, you know, they themselves are the asset. In other words, uh, the, the two founders are, are the assets. Um, but we would, we would also make this a very, uh, it, that seems like a low barrier to just say that the, you, the people then therefore are the assets and therefore we're done with the conversation. And then they might say, well, they actually had these heterogeneous assets, which was this, um, the iPhone uh, and the reader that they built, which, you know, that's interesting. Uh, it is absolutely interesting. But companies like Verifone um, or Fujitsu really could have also done uh, that kind of work. But really what's actually the thing that is valuable at the inception of the firm and really what drove the development of the firm as well as drove what it is that they were going to do was the design. And that's something that for some reason is often left off of this theorization um, about the development firms. That it's actually the design that is actually the most valuable asset to this particular uh, company at the time of its inception. And that without that design, nothing else would actually be very valuable itself, including the founders. Although you definitely need to have smart people. Now, oops, and this is just a, an explanation um, for that. So when they started out, they really hardly had any existing asset base. Um, I use the quotation marks heterogeneous asset base because that's what economists will say, that uh, what distinguishes firms and why firms start is that they have heterogeneous asset bases, and so therefore um, these will be heterogeneous firms, they'll be different firms. Uh, but it seems to me, at least from a design point of view, to be a rather weak argument because um, the heterogeneous asset base that they had was really quite nothing. It was an iPhone, which I'm pretty sure almost all of us had, uh, or you know, many of us have an iPhone, uh, and they, they had this um, electronic uh, reader system, uh, which was put together uh, using relatively simple microelectronics uh, for which uh, a large number of people would have access to that kind of technology. So the heterogeneous asset base that they had you know, was really not very heterogeneous. Um, really what they had was that they had that design. And then what's really important and what kind of takes away from the other arguments about tax liability and et cetera um, is uh, the work by uh, um, an economist named Deirdre McCloskey. And she basically then makes the argument that capital is never really the reason why firms start. So she says very uh, explicitly in her book, Bourgeois Equality, that capital is not the in initiating cause of economic um, advancement, ideas are. And in particular, what she calls trade testable ideas are actually what causes economies to advance. So in, in other words, without using the word design, Deirdre McCloskey is actually advocating that um, design is actually the initiating cause um, of economic advancement. And then capital follows the good idea. Capital doesn't follow necessarily assets themselves. Capital follows ideas. So we're going to go now to a little bit of, of what I call an old story, um, which is, is uh, based upon some consulting work that I did within, with a company in Australia, uh, which was an insurance company. Uh, and they were um, under threat uh, by the idea of self-driving cars. And they were under threat by, uh, by the idea of self-driving cars because they were essentially concerned that if self-driving cars were as good as they were um, advertised to be, in other words, they would never get into an accident, then there is nothing to insure. So if I'm an insurance company who insures basic, uh, based on information asymmetry, that I know more about the risk of driving than you do, uh, and I also insure because humans are fallible and make lots of mistakes and get into accidents, 
then if I have a, a, a world full of self-driving cars in which the self-driving cars or Google knows also as much as I do in relation to the likelihood of accidents happening because Google probably has even more information than I do um, as, as an insurance company. And on top of that, the algorithms uh, that are driving these self-driving vehicles also are infallible. They don't get into accidents. Well, I no longer have a business. So what do I do? So I was brought in because they had actually brought in some design thinking people as well um, and didn't get too far. Uh, and I left that blank. Like, would, I'm kind of curious to think what you think someone with a design thinking background gave them in terms of advice. But we'll get there in just a second. So you know, when we, I actually work with them, you know, we actually went through all the ideas about a competitive advantage and theories of the firm without using those particular words. But basically, they told me that they were already very good at doing everything. Right? They were already very, very good at deploying or redeploying their unique assets. Well, actually, what was mostly interesting was that they told me that you know, we don't even have any unique assets anymore, really. Money is actually very cheap for them. And any insurance company in the world can compete in Australia because money is pretty cheap. Liquidity is actually very cheap in the world, uh, at least the way that they looked at the, uh, at the cost of money. And the other part, which is also very expensive, is data. You know, data about driving patterns and behaviors. It turns out that that's actually, a, you can buy that. So it turns out that there's very little in terms of unique assets that, that differentiate the companies. And so it's very difficult for them to use assets as a way of thinking about developing a competitive advantage. And that's the resource-based school of firms. In terms of knowledge, you know, they say, yes, you know, we, do, um, you know, we do have these cross-functional teams, the different groups. Um, but we found that they weren't necessarily that helpful because we don't know why we're bringing teams that together necessarily other than to solve operational problems. In other words, helping us to do things better. But in terms of figuring out the next right thing to do, that's not necessarily, um, it doesn't actually help us to figure out that problem. And then the notion of dynamic capabilities, which is from David Teese at the Haas Business School. You know, I asked him about that. He said, oh, you know, we are very, very, very good at launching new insurance products. If we find a specific customer segment that we think we want to go into, we can launch an insurance product within three to six months. And so, for example, they gave me the example that, Andy, did you know that in Australia, you can go and insure your, your classic American car, and we have a specialized brand for that because none of the people who buy insurance in that area would want to be seen as buying a brand from us because we would seem that it's too stodgy. So you know, they actually can do all those things. So they flew in one of the world's premier people uh, who do work in design thinking uh, and, and, and went through an exercise and paid that person a very good fee. What do you imagine was actually the advice that, that they were given in the end in terms of applying design thinking to their strategic problem? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> I know this is almost like a pop quiz, but, I, but off the top of your head, given what you know about what Tim Brown and others have written about um, design thinking, what would you think would be the, in the end, what do you think their recommendation was? <laughs> okay, for all of those of you who do UX in here, you're probably going to be very mad at me. <laughs> But basically, the advice that came back was improve the user experience of buying insurance. And that was the strategic advice that was given to them. And I can tell you that, well, what do you think the board reacted to when they heard that advice? That's not what they wanted to hear. <laughs> uh, but they really largely saw that as a technical matter. And this is, this is as I was saying, this is why it borne out the frustration that I see of design trying to move up in the world in terms of strategy, but largely settling back down uh, into giving, uh, I think, you know, very uh, rudimentary um, technical, technical advice. So that's not what we did. Uh, that's actually not what we did with them in the end. We actually went back to our own theory of design, um, and we're going to talk about some of the capabilities uh, that we helped them to develop uh, based upon the theory of the, of the firm uh, from a design point of view and actually in, in order to actually help them through this specific problem, which had nothing to do with improving the user experience of buying insurance. Um, at all. So that just takes me really into the meat of the theory. Um, and I'm going to address um, three issues. But I think uh, given uh, in terms of timing, but also interest, um, my personal interest in this topic, I'll spend more time on the third one, which is the type of capabilities that firms should have, or what economists would say, you know, their production function. How it is that firms generate cash flow. That is, that is basically the big question that economists want to understand. How, how do you make money? 
um, in a firm. And I won't spend too much time in the uh, in coming into being. Why does that could they come into existence? I think I addressed some of those questions. Um, and I won't spend too much time on the structure of firms because otherwise, in order to do that, we have to get into a really deep conversation about product architectures um, in order to be able to get into that. But I'll hint at some of the ideas um, that underlie that. So first, I want to just start with this notion of coming into being. Why do, why do firms exist in, in, in any case? And I like to show this cartoon. I know this cartoon has been shown in, in many, many different ways and in many, many different contexts. But it's kind of a classic cartoon because it shows the difficulty of communicating ideas across multiple uh, departments, multiple stages of, for example, a product uh, development life cycle, right? Uh, all the way from what marketing wanted uh, all the way to uh, what customers wanted. And this actually, for, uh, although it's an amusing cartoon, is actually part of, of typical explanations of why it is that firms exist which is that it's actually more expensive for you to communicate knowledge outside of the boundaries of the firms than to actually keep the knowledge and communicate it within the boundaries of the firm. That's actually part of the, of the knowledge-based theory of the firm, that there's this information cost uh, and communication cost associated with um, communicating outside the firm, and so that's why we see this knowledge bounded within uh, the boundaries of the firm. And we also know from a lot of design behavior research that this is also the situation with designs that when it really comes, when that does, that designs are normally imperfectly complete. They're never actually necessarily fully specified, uh, despite the fact that we'd like to think that they actually can be fully specified. The other, uh, which we've also found, and not me, when I say we, this is the royal we, this is the field uh, speaking, is that um, design processes are situated. In other words, that who you are and when, where you are and when it is that you do the design work matters uh, in relation to the, uh, the actual outcome of the design itself. As well as that during the design process, you invent and discover issues and requirements that could never have been fully specified in advance. And so that's what we mean by designs are actually perfectly uh, complete. They're never fully specified. And so there's a very, very high cost for you to try to communicate the design outside the boundaries of the firm. And that's why once you have a, de a, a design, it's normally found within the boundaries of, of the firm. And, the, and what I will describe as the frame for the design is actually the thing that bounds the sca sco sca oh, scale and scope um, of the firm. OK. So here, the idea is that when a firm begins, they have to have um, a, a, design pro a, a, a design for a new product or a production process, uh, but also that the design must have some sufficient level of structural, cohere uh, structural integrity such that that structural co integrity um, allows that design to be a tradable unit um, in terms of a transaction. So in other words, it becomes an economic unit. And these, this actually, the wording, the reason why I had to actually type this down and write it down is that this actually comes from classic research in design theory which is what constitutes a good design. And one of the ideas that comes from that research is that the, a good design always has some sort of structural integrity. It has some sort of coherence, and this is something that we teach to our design students and to which they are always um, uh, crit criticized um, during the, the design crit, right? We're always looking for this level of, of structural coherence or this, uh, this sort of integrity. And that integrity, in a sense, leads to what we like to call as your frame or sometimes in architecture it's called the party, or in other disciplines it's called the concept. You know, these are the things that actually hold the design together, um, and it's an intellectual construct. It's not something that we can measure very well. But that construct is what we make an argument as therefore describing the boundaries of the firm, because anything else that happens outside of that boundary is, is not part of the design, and everything that happens inside of that boundary is part of the design, and is very expensive for us to communicate, because it's, it's, it's never perfectly specifiable um, other, by, other than by the people who actually are involved in the design itself. And so those people then become part of the boundary um, of the firm. Um, I, I had these little uh, pictures just to kind of uh, reinforce some of this point, but if you look at the history of the Apple computer, for example, you find this, these notions of structural integrity. If you look at all successful products, or all pro successful products that end up defining a firm, there's always this notion of structural integrity. So for example, in this case, the structural integrity being the first low-cost uh, microcomputer system with video terminal and 8K bytes of RAM on a single PC card. That's the structural integrity that defined the very first Apple. Um, and then the, in the Apple II, 
what defines its structural integrity, um, and th which is, this is a quote from, again, from Barry Cates' book, um, Make It Better, in which he interviews Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs makes a statement or asks the question, what if we could make a computer that people didn't have to assemble um, and you could sell a lot more? Um, and, so he sa and then he goes on to say, so we wanted to put the Apple II in a housing that would reflect more of a humanistic point of view. So there is the structural integrity, there is the coherence that he's bringing into this specific product. And once we found a way to do that, the next question was what should it look like, what should it express, how should it work? So you know, all these ideas really are, it's just design. There's no design thinking in this. We don't have to bring in design thinking to explain it. This is just good design theory and it's also good design practice. So that particular, uh, these particular ideas of structural integrity, coherence, and frame are what then drive the development um, of the firm itself. Then it, it exists. The second question I want to address is firm structure. So what, and when I mean firm structure, what I mean here is organizational structure. How is the, act, the organization actually put together? Um, if you talk to most companies, organizations are, are put together sometimes by function, so, or they're put together by geography, or they're put together by product line, or there's some mixture between product line, geography, and function, for example. But, uh, and there are different theories that explain that, but none of those theories actually come from a theory of the firm necessarily. But there's actually been a lot of work uh, in, particularly in engineering design and software design, trying to understand what is the right kind of organizational structure for a specific product. And basically the question is the following. Does the organizational structure then determine the product architecture? In other words, if I have a very modular organizational structure in which I actually put together things by function, do I end up with a product that looks, in, that looks like that? Or is it that I had some design team work on some product, and given the architecture of the product that they came up with, that actually drives the organizational design. So the answer to that, of course, is that it's, it's both. And it's now, it's been called, what's called the mirroring hypothesis. And the mirroring hypothesis states that the product or service itself largely determines the organizational structure. So the way that this was studied um, is, is, pretty, is quite interesting. So in a couple of the large studies that have been done, um, one study was with uh, Boeing and one study was um, with software. So in the study with Boeing, what they did was that they, they actually didn't look at the airplane itself. I'm sorry, it was actually with Pratt & Whitney with Boeing. And they looked at the, the product architecture of a jet engine. And they also looked at the communication that went on between people who were associated with the design and engineering of the jet engine. And what they wanted to see was, we know what we think the product architecture of a jet engine is. There's a low pressure, low pressure compression chamber, high pressure compression chamber, electrical system, turbine, et cetera, et cetera. So there were kind of major um, subsystems to a jet engine. And the departments were also kind of positioned in the same way. So there was high pressure chamber, so there was a department that does that. There's another uh, low pressure, so there's a department that does that particular work. And then what they did was they looked at the communication overlap. To what extent do people communicate between the, the low pressure and high pressure uh, chamber and how much do they communicate inside, for example? So in other words, if your product architecture matched your organizational structure perfectly, you should have very, very little communication outside of your, of your group. And the communication should be exactly in the directions predicted by the product architecture. And what they actually found was that, in fact, they, in this particular instance, it didn't match up. It didn't match up, and it did not improve until the company we thought and looked at their product architecture more carefully to actually see that they didn't have the seven different subsystems that they thought it had. It actually only had four different subsystems. And then they reorganized the people such that those people who were working within those four subsystems were more co-located together, and then they were communicating amongst themselves. Okay, does that make sense? So in other words, what they're saying is that we thought that we had seven departments because each one of these seven departments worked on a specific part of the jet engine and they don't need to talk to anybody else because they only need to talk to each other and only a little bit of communication outside because they should have been able to specify the interface between the different parts of the jet engine properly. That did not turn out to be the case. And it did not turn out to be the case until they realized that they actually really only had four departments. And these four departments are the ones who should talk to each other 
closely because of the way that the product was actually architected. And the second study was done um, uh, on software, in which what they did was they studied open source software versus software uh, developed in-house in a company. And when they did that, the expectation was that open source software should be very modular software because you have disparate teams who are working at different times um, on the software, so therefore it was likely that the software was highly modularized so that it would not have to be a high degree of coordination between the groups. Whereas a company can have a high degree of coordination between groups and you would tend to find a lower degree of modularity in um, privately developed software. And that's exactly what they found. Open source software tended to be very modular and commercially developed software tended to be more integral. So that lends support to this particular idea that the product or service itself largely determines the space of feasible organizational structures um, in order to develop that. But I think actually what the most interesting thing um, uh, is actually is really about what are the capabilities that firms should have in order for them to generate cash flow because that's actually in, at the end of the day, that's what companies do. They have to make money. And if the companies aren't making money, then they will definitely will not be, um, will not be a company. And that's where I would like to spend at least the last 10 minutes, if we don't run out of time, uh, some question time, uh, to be able to talk about. But to do that, I just want to have, I do have to start out by saying, you know, I have to now give a slightly broader definition of design. Um, and I have to go away from the, the definition of design or design thinking that many people will use, which is that design is a problem solving process. I have actually told my students, you are not allowed to ever say that ever again. Design is not a problem solving process. And if you say it in front of me, you'll probably get um, yelled at or get a stern look. And I joke with them and say, you know what's a problem solving process? How to figure out the, the length of a hypotenuse in a right triangle. That's a problem solving process. And I'm pretty sure that that's not what we do. So I tell them you have to use the word, if you give me anyone a simple definition of design, it needs to probably be at least this one. Design is an act of value creation. Um, and so, you know, I, again, I'm going back to uh, classic design theory here, where, uh, which says that design is actually about creating preferred situations in which really the only known is some value, and designers actually figure out that connection between the unknown and the value that is, that is intended. Um, and many other authors have started to agree with exactly what I, was, I have been saying, is that we should never simply view design as problem solving. It's always some sort of inquiry into products, services, environment, meetings, and context. And it's kind of within this milieu of thinking of design as a value creation process or act of, an act of value creation uh, rather than problem solving is where we then derive some of these, these interesting uh, and notice these interesting behavioral regularities by which I, ex ex I, I extrapolate them into thinking about what are the kind of capabilities that firms ought to have in order to generate cash flow. And the very first and probably the most important um, capability um, is this particular capability of framing. Framing is this particular idea that we have particular ways of seeing the world and that those particular ways of seeing the world determine the way that we will look at a specific um, situation. And the hypothesis is that novel design solutions do not come from the solutions themselves. Novel design solutions come from novel framings of situations. If you remember back to my, uh, my example with the insurance company, this is actually what we focused on. We actually tried to focus on reframing what it is that the company is. Is the company really going to be an insurance company when there's really no insurance necessarily? Can we even think of you as an insurance company? And that's actually the exercise we went through. Um, and we went through that exercise using a concept that, um, that my colleagues and I developed which we called generative sensing. Generative sensing was actually a capability that we observed um, across a number of different design studies in which we observed the following type of behavior, which I guess some people called it a problem solving behavior, we didn't, we didn't call it that. But this is the behavior that we observed and you can, tell, you can think in your mind whether or not you've seen this yourself or you have um, witnessed it yourself in, in the way that you practice. So generative sensing begins with this notion that that you see a pattern of behavior, or you see something going on. In other words, this is your indifference level. This is the thing that everyone's been doing, and, and, and you, you, you notice that there's a pattern there. But you notice some kind of anomaly. You notice people doing workarounds. You notice people uh, taking a specific product and doing something else with it. So you notice some specific value that, that people are expressing, but don't seem to have a very good solution for that specific value. And so you come up with, with a hypothesis. 
you have a new hypothesis that explains the way that that value might be able to be created. And the only way that you can test that hypothesis, because that hypothesis is neither logically nor scientifically true, we don't know whether or not it could be true. So the only way that we could know that it's true is actually to build a prototype. And it's actually in the prototype that the innovation happens. It's in building the prototype that actually the, the innovation occurs. And for the insurance company I worked with, that's exactly what they did. And that's exactly where the innovation came from. So for them, the anomaly was churn. But not churn in the way that they, that they normally see it. So churn in insurance basically means you're a customer with Geico, uh, and then you leave Geico. That's churn. And the, the normal pattern is that once you leave Geico, that would be it. You'd never go back to Geico. You would go to 20th century, and then you'd probably stay with them for the rest of your life, or vice versa. Very, very, very few people change insurance companies multiple times in their life, if at all. I don't think my parents have ever changed their, uh, their uh, car insurance company until the company went bankrupt and was bought out by another company, and then they just continued with the new company uh, that, uh, 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 that they were switched to. And in, in fact, myself in Australia, I know that I never even bothered to change my health insurance company until they went bankrupt and were bought out, and, and I just kept with that same company as well. But so what they were seeing is there was something different, was that people were leaving them and coming back, and then leaving them and then coming back, and then leaving them and coming back. And that was an unusual signal for them to see, because they had never seen that type of churn before. Their, their basic hypothesis, which was easy to prove, and which we, we did not reject, but we simply found that it was not interesting, was that that was due to the level of incentives. Well, yes, of course, incentives are always going to make people switch insurance companies. But there might have been something else going on. And so the hypothesis that we eventually developed was that the insurance was actually becoming a frictionless market, very much like stock exchange. Now, when we made that hypothesis, many people thought, no, that can't be true. Insurance, you know, there's always going to be some sort of friction associated with switching insurance companies. And we said, OK, because you can't decide whether or not that's true or false, let's go build a prototype to test that. So what we did was we partnered up with an artificial intelligence agent group um, who build stock exchanges to help people simulate stock exchange transactions, and in particular, high-speed stock exchanges. Or, I'm sorry, sorry high-speed stock trades. And we simulated um, a two-sided market in which on the one side you have AI agents, such as, let's say, a very smart Siri. Uh, and on the other side, you would have insurance companies, not necessarily the company who I'm working with. And basically, that the, these AI agents would broker against each other to buy and sell what eventually we would call micro-insurance or possibly even nano-insurance. In other words, we would say that you can buy insurance uh, only for one hour. Uh, for my Uber drive back to San Francisco. Or I could only buy insurance for 20 minutes uh, for my Uber drive to the restaurant. Or I could buy insurance to say that um, I'm going to make it to my interview on time, um, and then that's all I'm going to buy my insurance for. And that in the end, we reframed the company as FinTech, uh, but not just a FinTech company, they were actually an exchange. They were going to develop the technology that would allow you to exchange insurance contracts um, on an open market. And the, that's actually what they were going to be in the future, because there would be a will, will be a market for the microinsurance, even though there may not necessarily be an insurance for cars. Um, but we reframed entirely what the company would be. So that's what that led to. And of course, finally, the other important um, uh, capability that firms must have is they need to be able to have this particular capability um, of prototyping. And by prototyping, what I'm, I, I, we actually emphasize here and what we also teach is when, by prototype, we don't just mean that you're good at making a rough, low scale, low fidelity um, version of the product that you're developing. When we mean prototyping, what we mean is that you're very good at decomposing situations. In other words, decomposing a very complex problem uh, into units such as possible for you to test specific value creating propositions. Um, within the your available means. In other words, within acceptable loss. This is how much money we're willing to lose on this prototype. And based upon how much money we're going to lose on this prototype, we decompose that specific problem, and then we test a specific proposition against that specific problem. And that's what we mean by, we mean by prototyping. And the reason why I call this a specific capability is that this is actually not what I observe students doing as a general. Most students, when they build a prototype, will simply try to build the best looking that it's closest to 
the final design idea that they think they're going to have. In other words, most people are tempted to test what they know as opposed to testing what they don't know and are also not willing um, to make the, uh, the decision on what is actually the acceptable loss. They try to think about, we think, uh, in, in the wrong direction, how much can I spend uh, in, in order to learn? Whereas we th would like to think in the opposite, how much am I willing to lose and what can I learn from what it is that I'm about to lose? Because with the prototype, you're, you're generally not ever going to get your money back. So that's why we have to talk about that in terms of uh, expected loss. And this, this set of ideas is highly influenced by um, a well-known uh, 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 theorist in, entrepreneurial, in entrepreneurialism, uh, Sarah Saraswathi, which she uh, calls effectuation, and that that's the difference between what she calls causation and effectuation, where causation is where you know something is going to happen, and so you follow through on that thing that is going to happen, versus effectuation, which is that you work within available means and see what's possible given what it is that you can do. So let me just wrap up on, on some of these ideas and, and finish off with the thinking of the, the, uh, some answers to the, to the basic problems that we tried to address tonight, um, which are, you know, what are firms? So some people say that firms are bundles of resources. Some people say that firms are bundles of contracts. Some people say that firms are bundles of knowledge. Um, I would like to say that firms are really bundles of designs because designs delimit the firms. Designs are the initial act of value creation. They are the thing that brings structural co integrity and coherence to a firm. Um, contracts don't bring that structural co uh, integrity. Contracts are merely a way to enforce a set of relationships between people. We see firms, therefore, um, in, in the market because designs are almost always imperfectly complete. They can never be fully specified. There's always going to be some cost um, associated with communicating um, that design um, outside the boundary of the firm, which Boeing discovered um, very um, negatively, one might say, uh, when they discovered that it was actually not really very costless um, for them to split up their firm or split it in a way which was basically to subcontract much of the design um, and uh, production of different parts of their 787. It's not simply a question of transaction cost economics. It, it, it's the, the problem is that designs are not completely specified. Uh, it's very expensive to communicate that information outside boundaries of firms. And for those of you who follow Boeing and their 787 production problems, you did know that eventually they brought back some of these com uh, companies back under their direct control simply because they realized it was actually not possible for them to, um, to subcontract out um, outside the boundaries of their firm. And then finally, that, that frame, this particular notion of structural integrity and coherence, which I think I've carried through a lot of this discussion, is that that frame delimits the scale and the scope um, or the boundary of that firm. And that that frame, which is one of the capabilities of the firm, can therefore be changed. And as uh, firms change their frame, then they become some new firm. There's some novelty that, that arises from a reframing of the situation for the firm, and the firm gets to continue to live on. So I hope I've planted some seeds of ideas in you tonight um, in ways of, of taking the what you know and what you practice in this particular, particular area of design uh, and to try to take some of those much further into the economic theorization um, about the organization, I'm sorry, uh, economic theorization on economic organization itself. Uh, where tonight what we really just focus on were firms. Why do firms exist? And I really think that as a field, we have to get into this particular business because otherwise we will always be arguing with um, our peers uh, who are always going to be saying things such as, well, we could just go ahead and subcontract that out um, of the company. That really won't matter. It's cheaper for us to do it that way. We need to have a credible argument uh, that comes back and explains that actually if we think of firms in the following way, that argument is not a very strong one and we also have very good empirical evidence to show that that's actually not going to be a smart thing for you to do in relation to your firm. And I think in doing so, it will actually continue to elevate um, all the work that we do in design from design as a technical matter, design as strategy, to now design as a foundational view for economic organization. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Hi. So thank you for your talk. It was a wonderful talk. Um, 
I enjoyed especially what you said about prototyping um, and how often it's kind of an unsophisticated approach to it. Um, I, I can think of one example that stu sticks in my mind is someone who was redesigning or thinking about the design of getting your dressing changed with like a wound, um, something like a collarbone fracture in it. And to build that empathy within themselves, to, to prototype it, if you will, they had their back waxed. And that was kind of a way to simulate what that experience might be. Um, so aside from like kind of creatively just kind of going out there and thinking like, yeah, how can we kind of you know, prototype this? I'm wondering if you have any type of analytical framework, either yourself or if, you know, some of the scholars that, that you know about to kind of help structure that, to kind of build that into the practice. That, you know, it, it, I think that there's, I haven't, I have not come up with a general theory of prototyping, if, I think, if that's what you're asking, because, um, but the only idea that I would have there is to try to figure out, to, to decompose the specific situation of, in this case, um, what is the problem again? It was uh, dealing with a specific wound. Okay, so you're trying to understand the causal, uh, the causal reasons for the pain. Changing the dressing. Okay. Changing the dressing, Changing the dressing in, your, in your wound. Right. So I think that the person sounds as if they were, were probably approaching it in the right way, which yeah, is I simply, think, yeah. uh, which unfortunately in this case sounds like they had to injure themselves uh, in order to actually understand. But the other thing that you might also, that the person possibly wanted, maybe would, what, would rather have studied is how long does the pain linger? So you would, you, so the, if you decompose the situation in, into figuring out the little elements of what's going on instead of actually having to go through the entire process of injuring yourself. Um, you might also look at some really interesting work that was done by Dan Kahneman and some of his colleagues about the nature of pain as from a behavioral economic point of view uh, and the extent to which the, the length of the pain matters a lot more than necessarily the, the amount of pain. So that, that's an example of, of decomposing that, that situation of pain into constituent variables, which is duration versus extent. So for example, basically what he shows is that if I give you a dull pain for a very long period of time, that's actually worse to you than a very short but sharp pain. I believe that that's what the research uh, came out with. Great. Yes, sir. So, so I'd like to follow up on the prototyping. Mm -hmm. um, you, you seem to describe it as a, a cost, a loss. Um, but isn't it all about reducing opportunity costs? And so you could actually then turn that around as a gain and a, <laughs> a profit? Um, the reason why I use the word acceptable loss in this case is that, that in, in practice, I guess in terms of financial accounting terms, it's, it's a loss. You know, there's going to be, an, there has to be an acceptable loss. And one of the things that I, and, and I, th I think part of this is so much, is because it's so much informed by my teaching. So when we work with students and we ask them uh, how much do you want to spend um, on, on, the, on, on your prototype, it really is from a loss point of view. You're going to lose $50, and that's probably the only, maybe that's because that's actually how we get them to think about the salient factors that they actually have to prototype, because they're never gonna get that $50 back necessarily. Now you're right, in fact, if you prototype something correctly uh, and you solve a problem, you, know, you, 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 you save that money in the future because you won't incur a, a recall or you won't incur some design flaw that you find later on. I, I completely agree with you um, on those specific issues. The, the point I think that we're trying to make here in, in terms of the effectuation theory and in terms of prototyping is that uh, when people are encouraged to think about this as acceptable loss, you're less likely to overspend in relation to your prototype because there does seem to be a tendency to want to spend more money um, on the prototype to get it as close to the final product as, is, as it could be, as opposed to decomposing the situation into constituent elements where we really test the things that we don't know. Uh, and then, once we know those things, then building a prototype, maybe in the way that you're thinking the prototype, you know, is the thing where you'll spend a lot, all your money on. And that's almost like late stage prototyping in, in my view. You, you pretty much already have your design known and now you just, need to, you just need to put together something as opposed to what we're talking about is we don't even know exactly what this thing is gonna do yet. So, and, and there's other people who have these different semantics on different stages of prototyping as well. And I, it might just be that I'm thinking early you're thinking a little bit later, but you're seeing you're thinking early too. Yeah, it, it's by um, making the wise choice to reduce the risk that will cost you the most. 
is what saves you the most money. And I, th I think basically I agree with that premise. And the only thing that I'm switching around is that it's, it's, we, because we can't know necessarily how much money we're going to save, we couch it within is how much money are you willing to lose now. That may be the only difference. When you define just to stay on the prototyping theme for a moment, because <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. Um, so when you said it was decomposing situations in, into units, such that it is possible to test positions, I mean, that's very much what we do in the early stage of work when we have an idea for a concept and we, we perceive there's a need for something or there's a, there's a situation we're trying to improve. So we might have um, smaller, you know, not, not very well-defined concepts, but ideas that are representative of how we can make the situation better. And that's um, uh, something we can put in front of people as part of a conversation we have with them as part of doing generative research and uh, being in the field. But I wondered if you had um, some other uh, framework or way of thinking about how to do the decomposition in a way that's especially effective. <laughs> oh. I don't know if I could tell you anything more than you probably don't already know yourself. And that's one of the challenges of giving this talk to a, a very specialized design audience. To an audience of business people, this would be considered almost groundbreaking um, <laughs> because that's not necessarily the way. Uh, so I think that the way that I, I always look at it and prob probably the way that you would also do it is to frame it in the way of a testable hypothesis. In other words, where you pretty much can control a dependent variable and there's a, a, an observable uh, independent, I'm sorry, I, an independent variable and an observable dependent variable, pardon me. And that's, that is actually the way that I even work with my students in developing their new venture ideas for entrepreneurialism. So they have this very, very complex idea for creating value, but we can't even identify the salient variables, which are the independent variables that they can control that might have some relationship to the dependent variable that they, they cannot necessarily control. And so that's what we try to do. We try to find out, try to find those variables and then create the prototype that allow us to test those specific variables under various uh, situations and conditions and then determine kind of the distribution of outcomes that they, that they get under, under different testing regimes. So that, that's the framework that I use in my mind. I mean, that does seem to work pretty well. But it, of course, that also goes back to my generative sensing ideas, which is that everything is a hypothesis test. So we practice good science there in terms of developing those hypotheses and then testing them. Yeah. But then I think you already knew that. <laughs> I'm not seeing more hands, so I'll ask a question, and that is, if is anyone here in the audience driving to San Francisco with a spare seat in their car who might be willing to give a ride to our speaker? We have one hand raised. That's great. Um, any other questions from anybody? So. I you're allowed now to leave, yes, if you haven't already, <laughs> those people, <laughs> and also come up and greet the speaker for private questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very I'll much. I'll thank Andy Dawn. Thank you. <laughs>